All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is uh, Bertolt Reimold. I'm actually from the same lab as uh, Jim Sporer. And uh, we have some flickering here. Uh, Ganesh just gave me the bad look. I have only 10 minutes. <laughs> so I'm going to go very fast. Nevertheless, um, no, it, it is a weekend. Uh, and usually on the weekends, uh, Twitter is getting very hot. So I, I thought I'm going to start off with a tweet. <laughs> Uh, which is showing here now, uh, on and off. Okay, so my my, my tweet, it's, it's probably not what uh, you might expect. <laughs> so it is a tweet uh, actually from David Kenny, who is a, an IBM uh, Senior Vice President for IBM Cloud and Watson. And he actually sent out this tweet early in the week from the IBM Think Conference about uh, the Power9 and Nimbix uh, targeting AI, AI which is a, was a huge, huge topic uh, at the conference. And uh, at the same conference, uh, uh, IBM Senior Vice President John Kelly uh, gave a keynote and he invited uh, Jensen, the uh, CEO of uh, NVIDIA, onto the stage for an interview. And Jensen, he actually came out with a, a P9 in his hand. Uh, unfortunately, it blends into his skin, so you can barely see it here. And uh, he took us through some of the applications and the use cases that they are uh, doing um, with those, uh, at, uh, with the, obviously with the GPUs and in combination with the P9. And both of them are, as you can see, very happy. But as <laughs> the interview went along, actually, Jensen, he took the P9 and he put it in his pocket, saying, that's mine now, I'm not going to return it to you. <laughs> I, I thought it was very funny. So let's get a little bit more serious here. You might have missed this highlight uh, last year. It's uh, IBM Research achieving a record deep learning performance. Um, bringing training time down from uh, weeks to hours uh, by having this co-optimized uh, software and hardware um, with near linear scaling. Um, it was for a ResNet uh, 101 uh, on ImageNet and they took uh, not the P9s, but at that time that was still the P8s. They took 64 of those uh, P8s. Each one of them had uh, four GPUs in it. Uh, so a total of 256 uh, GPUs, and just to demonstrate uh, the scale out. And it took them about seven hours uh, to reach an accuracy of 33%, uh, and uh, Microsoft and Google, they were not able to accomplish that. Uh, I think that was uh, quite a nice accomplishment here. Uh, now let's get uh, a little bit more serious here. Um, do you guys know what that is at the bottom? Uh, so that is a... Uh, pathology image, okay? So you can take a whole bunch of those uh, whole slide images, uh, transform them, enhance them, and so forth, and train a convolutional network on them, okay? And then you can take uh, your trained model and do some uh, scoring um, to predict as a tumor proliferation score, which is an indication for um, how progressive your uh, breast cancer could be, okay? So it can be uh, serious or moderate or less advanced. So that, uh, in that example, we just took a ResNet, which may not be the best choice. Uh, this one is an MRI of an upper body. Um, you can train a convolutional network on it, and then you can do inference uh, with that trained model and identify organs uh, in that image. Okay. The reason why I wanted to show that example here because all those uh, models, ResNet, 50, 100, 150, VGG, uh, AlexNet, GoogleNet, blah, 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 all those nets are super popular. But if you really want to get into the nuts and bolts, then you need to do uh, much more specific networks here. This uh, network that we use for image segmentation, it's called UNet. UNet because it's, you know, it has probably a dozen and a half layers in it but you can really shape, uh, think of it as a shape of a U with a contraction and an expansion phase uh, to it. Um, we have many, many more use cases, uh, but I'm not going to take you all th through all those use cases. Uh, let me just summarize them uh, and what are the challenges here. Um, a data scientist in an enterprise, okay, I'm not talking about web companies here, uh, they really need to do their own networks. They need to do their own machine learning algorithms. They need to do their own uh, deep neural networks. And developing those networks, designing them, such as a UNet, for instance, 
uh, takes a lot of time and providing the right tools to go through that process very, very efficiently is a uh, top priority in my opinion. And uh, taking those algorithms and networks then and running them in the enterprise or in the medical domain, which is super important, uh, on many different data characteristics that is very, very challenging because somebody gives you some dense data, expects the same performance for sparse data or even better, uh, as opposed to uh, 100,000 data points, all of a sudden you get uh, a million or several million data points and does your algorithm still scale uh, on what platform? Uh, in, as opposed to, you know, 100 features, you end up with 10,000 features. Are you gonna run out of memory or what's gonna happen uh, deploying that algorithm in your enterprise? Workloads are, you know, people always say, oh, machine learning, you know, compute intensive, deep learning, compute intensive. No, just plug in a GPU and you're happy. <laughs> uh, reality is actually very different. Not very different, but it's only the partial truth that you typically hear because not all those algorithms are always uh, compute intensive. Actually, it's, you have very often a mixed workload, okay? Most of them are actually memory uh, bound, okay? Especially if you have, you know, Linear algebra operation, if you do dense matrix multiplication, sure, compute bound. But if you do matrix vector multiplication, it's actually I.O. memory bandwidth bound, okay? Very important. In terms of operations that you need to optimize for, there's a lot of data trans manipulation happening. Linear algebra is happening. If you get into deep learning, convolution, uh, or specialized LSM kernels are happening, and all your algorithms are uh, iterative, all very true. And you have to go through the different stages here. In terms of deployment environments, that is very, very tricky. Most people only talk about training, but that's only part of it. Once you need to deploy it, what is your deployment environment, okay? Very often, you know, you need to be able to embed your trained model with some runtime into a workflow or into some solution, okay? How do you optimize for those kind of situations? How do you do with uh, data exchange between your previous step and the next step and so forth? Also, what kind of uh, systems libraries are you gonna use? Um, MKL, uh, OpenBlast, uh, you know, all the CUDA stack, of course, you want to exploit. Are you going to run in double precision or lower precision for performance? All those questions need to be answered. And then, of course, the hardware question. So we came up with a framework, and we started with that project about uh, almost 10 years ago. Okay, uh, We called it SystemML, and our goal was how can we address all those challenges? How can we make the life of a data scientist and take them through all those challenges very, very easy, okay? Because the data scientists, they want to develop their algorithms. But that is only the beginning, okay? <laughs> um, you still have to have a distributed implementation of that algorithm. It still needs to run on varying data sets. Uh, and you want to optimize for your hardware, which might be uh, a CPU or a GPU or an x86 or a P9 or a P8 um, or a TPU or an FPGA, and it can go on and on. It's never ending. Okay, and you don't want to bother your data scientists with all those different acronyms. So our job was, how can we simplify the life of a data scientist, okay? So we came up with this project and uh, we call it system ML, we call it declarative machine learning, and that's the elevator pitch for it. Uh, we provide you a language to implement your algorithms, okay? And uh, the language has a very strong foundation in linear algebra statistical functions as well as uh, deep learning extensions in it uh, that allows you to implement your algorithms and uh, also deploy those algorithms, okay? Um, we, we are able to automatically run them at scale. We can run in a single JVM on a CPU. We can push some of the operations if you have a GPU on the, onto the GPU. If the scale of your problem calls for a cluster compute, then we automatically parallelize uh, on a cluster. Uh, we don't have our own data parallel platform, but we just call out to Spark core APIs here. And the core of our system is really a cost-based optimizer that exactly understands all the operations that you're using, okay? And depending on those characteristics, we do a cost-based optimization on it and automatically generates the right execution plan that might execute a single node, uh, including scale-up to large memory, uh, multi-socket, many cores, or call out to, to a distributed data platform. We also support MapReduce, 
Uh, but lately we are mostly focusing on Spark for a data parallel platform. And we support many, many APIs, so you can invoke it from R, Python, um, command line, if you Spark or Hadoop user, uh, you can use it in uh, Power AI, you can use it in Jupyter, Zeppelin, and so forth. Okay, so uh, the reason why, it's, why we are so excited, and uh, it fits very nicely in the, in the big data stack here, it, uh, you know, everyone I assume is familiar with Spark. You have the core API and then all the popular libraries on top of it, Spark SQL, Streaming, MLib, and Graph. Um, system ML fits right in there in the sense of you can just produce an RDD uh, using Spark SQL, doing some filtering on it, and the resulting RDD you can just take as an input and feed it into system ML which produces an output that you can take back as an RDD and do further operations on it. Okay, so we have a very deep integration into the Spark ecosystem that way. System ML is open sourced. Uh, go check it out. Go to GitHub once you have your account, <laughs> for those who don't have one yet. Um, go to the upper right corner, give us a star. We appreciate it. <laughs> um, so we open sourced it in 2015. Um, we came out on Spark 1.6, uh, and then uh, on Spark 2.0. Uh, last year, it became an Apache top-level project, so we are super excited about that fact. Uh, we had our 1.0 release, uh, December 17, and this weekend, we're gonna do a 1.1 release, actually, which should come out, hopefully, on Monday. Um, here are all the Maven coordinates, uh, GitHub, and downloads, and so forth. Um, if you really want, if you're into science and KDD is one of the top conferences, if you go to our uh, homepage, systemml.apache.org, you can actually find a, a three-hour uh, hands-on KDD tutorial that we gave last year at KDD conference. How much more time do I have? <laughs> A few more minutes, okay. I just keep going until you kick me off. So why am I so excited about systemml, okay? But let's assume all of you guys are data scientists, okay? And you write up your super cool machine learning algorithm, okay? And you use a lot of uh, linear algebra operations in that algorithm, okay? Let's assume you write down, for whatever reason, matrix multiply x with y, and you take the trace of it, okay? Matrix multiplication, as all of you know, it's a cubic operation, okay? You do x times y, each cell, you have uh, square operations, and you do that so many times. And then it takes a trace of it, which means you only look at that result. The rest of it, you throw away, okay? Unnecessary compute. Now, as a data scientist, you don't want to think in terms of that performance. You have other things to worry about in terms of accuracy and so forth. Um, so SystemML actually understands the core of all those operations, okay, and automatically rewrites that expression into that expression, which produces exactly the same result. With a big difference that, as opposed to uh, cubic complexity, you, know, you only have uh, quadratic complexity, which gives you different asymptotic behavior, much better performance, okay? So that is just one simple example, and as you go through the implementation of a custom machine learning or deep learning algorithm, you would realize there's tons and tons of optimization possible, okay? And we look at all of those simple examples such as you create a random matrix and the result of it you need to multiply with seven for whatever reason, okay? You do the rand operation, then another binary cellwise operation afterwards and you pay for it in terms of compute. We automatically rewrite those expressions into why not create a, a random matrix with values between negative seven and plus seven, okay? Those are just very simple examples but they make a huge, huge performance difference. Okay, uh, how did we do that? SystemML, it's a full-fledged compiler, okay? Our syntax is an R-like syntax. We also have a Python-like syntax. 
Okay, so it's a full-fledged compiler with a language interface. We do parsing, live variable analysis, semantic validations, and so forth. And then we create an internal DAG for it, and then we do cost-based optimizations on it by applying all those cool rewrite operations that give you the best performance. Okay. Okay, neural networks, I think I'm going to skip through that. Uh, most people, I, I think, know that. Um, why, why, why do I want to show that slide? If you look, you know, in, in deep learning, I have all those layers, um, fully connected, convolution, uh, max pooling, blah, blah, blah. If you look at the core of those operations, quite a few of those layers are linear algebra operations, okay? We spent, you know, many, many years optimizing for those operations, okay? So for us, integrating deep learning into our uh, compiler was actually fairly straightforward, and all our op uh, optimizations just apply. Except for a few of them, convolution is one of them. You know, you can do FFT to do convolution, or you can do the IM to call approach to it. We decided to do, um, um, you know, a built-in function that actually optimizes best for convolution. Okay. That's a very cool topic. Um, you will not find many systems out there that uh, do that. We actually have compressed linear algebra in our system. Compression means you know, a lot of the algorithms are iterative algorithms, obviously, and most of them are actually I.O. bound. So the moment that your, um, your data set does not fit in memory and it has to spill to disk, your performance will go down the drain. Okay? So that's where people usually apply uh, compression. And we just use lightweight uh, compression techniques, okay? And then we are actually able to do our linear algebra operations on the compressed data. Okay, now some of you critics might not think, you know, <laughs> linear algebra, it's all numeric data. Uh, does compression really matter here? Yes, actually it matters a lot. We did this simple analysis here by looking at, at a bunch of data sets here apply gzip or snappy and our own compression techniques on it and as you can tell from the compression factors here you know, the compression ratios here it is actually quite uh, beneficial okay and we do you know run length encoding and all those different techniques under the covers compressed rows compressed columns and so forth what about performance performance so if you take MNIST, which is a, a, a popular data set for um, image classification. The problem is you know, compression is not for free. But what you want to see happening is if you do compression, you do not want to become slower. Okay? Now we took a small data set, 90 gigabytes, and you run it in a single node with and without compression. Okay? And our proof point was with compression, we do not want to be slower, okay? which is what we prove here. So that's just a little variance here. But now, as you blow up the data set and become larger and larger, our performance, you know, we can go infinitely faster than anyone else, right? Um, by, uh, you know, once you have the right compression in, in place there. Okay, and there's many, many more techniques. <laughs> um, I think I... We can do a webinar on this. You can do a webinar on it. Uh, uh, we did a lot of com uh, performance, com uh, uh, you know, we always have uh, what we call code generation in our system, okay? Um, if you study enough examples, um, such as this one here, um, code generation becomes very important if you stack all those operations, you do X times Y as the result of it, you need to multiply with C and so forth. You get all those intermediates. Intermediates means you compute the result, write it in memory, and for the next operation, you need to read it out again into the cache, and all of that is very expensive. Or you do uh, x times uh, v, and then you need to transport it, and then that would require two passes over it. Or another example here, which you find like uh, in the recommender systems very often, where you want to have, uh, you know, you have a large product and customer kind of matrix, and you want to factorize it into two lower ranked matrices using one of the you know, non-negative matrix factorization or any other algorithms there. As you do the update rules to uh, approximate your 
and your lower ranked matrix is there. You want to compute how close you are to the optimal of there. So what typically you need to do is you need to multiply those two lower ranked matrices and see how far off are you from the original one here. And that is a super expensive operation if you think about it because this one here produces a very large intermediate dense matrix, okay? While your original matrix for recommended systems such as you know, Amazon or Netflix or so forth, it's a super sparse matrix, okay? So you have a bunch of values there, but you spend all this time computing this huge, huge intermediate. Most of it you throw away, okay? And then because you only need to have those values actually, right? So we are actually sparsity aware, okay? So when we only compute those values in here, that are really needed in order to compute that expression there. So sparsity exploitation is very important here. And as we do micro benchmarks against, let's say TensorFlow, uh, or some of you might be familiar with Julia, TensorFlow claims to have uh, XLA, which is their version of code generation as well. What's the operator circle dot? Uh, Cellwise operation multiplication, or it could be addition as well. It's not matrix multiplication. Okay, um, then uh, exploiting sparsity or um, doing the right code generation actually can make a very significant uh, performance difference. And keep in mind that this one here is log scale. So I'm rushing through that thing here very quickly. Um, um, we did uh, obviously a lot of power experiments as well. Um, here are some preliminary numbers and uh, you know, with the many more cores, or the NV link between uh, P9 and the GPUs, we actually do see a performance difference, and people say, you know, 2x or 4x and so forth. We, we just run a, a linear regression conjugate gradient in here, where you have a lot, the core operation is a matrix vector multiplication here, and we do see, um, you know, many more cores that you typically have on, on a power processor actually is beneficial here. Um, it is also uh, true that uh, the, the faster communication between the CPU and the GPU with the Envy link, um, you know, communication can be the bottleneck and having that one two or four times faster is also beneficial for us. Okay, um, there's many more performance experiments, but I think I'm just gonna call it an end here. Anyone has any questions? I'm sorry that I really rushed through that very quickly. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, if some of you might wonder, you know, how do you really compare with, uh, you know, there's so many deep learning frameworks out there and choosing the right one, it's, or well, comparing with others, it's almost impossible, okay? Because, um, like for instance, uh, here I only chose three. No, SystemML and TensorFlow and BigDL. BigDL is another open source project from Intel, actually. And, um, you know, for deep learning, for machine learning, most of the time you will always do double precision. But for deep learning, single precision is actually sufficient here. But if you want to support machine learning and deep learning, then you need to support both. So in SystemML, we actually focus on, on both of them. Okay, while TensorFlow, they mostly focus on single precision, but don't care about double precision and big deal, they have this mix back there. And then it's also, you know, which one of the libraries do you support? Question for you. Yes. Uh, you have a first slide about benchmark. Uh, this is, uh, uh, the question is, are you compare that your NV link with the same uh, NVIDIA to a NVIDIA desktop uh, machine that didn't framework? Or you compare your stuff versus the TPU that Google using because that is totally different game. Yeah, no, we did not do any TPU experiments. Uh, we just uh, ran it. At, in fact, we ran it on Nimbix. Yeah, uh, because yeah. majority of the uh, stuff that you're running, you uh, on FPU, a lot of instructions that you don't really need it. Right. It just happened to be that the game guy using it. That this group of people just yeah. like yeah, kissing. Yeah, we didn't get any TPU access yet. We have, we've. We tried, but we are not successful yet. It's only 4,000 units around. <laughs> There's not too many of them. Okay. 4,656. <laughs> Any other questions? Any other questions for Bert? Okay, let's give him a round of applause.